Hey guys, welcome back. This week we're going to be talking about electromagnetic weapons. Things like rail guns, gauss cannons, coil guns. They all refer to weapons powered through electromagnetic energy. They're a staple in science fiction and Halo, and now without good reason. And that's because the technology behind them, while both being cool, it's also feasible. It's something we could do today. You know, several of the weapons that we use in Halo are based off of this. From handheld rail guns in Halo 4 and 5, all the way to the massive max stations that have been part of Halo since the very beginning. But just because something is doable, doesn't mean it'd be very practical. So that's what we're going to talk about this week. We're going to explore, you know, could we build MAC cannons and railguns? And also, would they be very useful? Jumping right into it, there's a lot of electromagnetic weapons in Halo. You have something like railguns, like the handheld ARC-920 that you see in Halo 4 and 5, the Mark 2547 heavy railgun that's the main weapon on the Mammoth, which we see in Halo 4, the Gauss cannon that's been on Warhog since forever, and even the mighty Mac cannon. Now, they're all powered through different means. Starting with the smallest, the ARC-920 uses a power cell, basically a chemical reaction to generate the electricity that can then be used to power the coil gun to launch a projectile. Now, some of the heavier ones, like Gauss cannons and the heavy railgun from the Mammoth, now that would require a power generation that's going to be a little bit more excessive than that. You could do something like onboard motors, continuously charging capacitors that would then discharge to fire around. That concept is relatively the same when we talk about MAC cannons, just on a much, much grander scale. According to the lore, some of the biggest ones, you know, at least in the books, around Reach, are powered by ground stations which I'll talk about that here in a bit because I think that's incredibly impractical and I'll, t I'll tell you why. The appearance of all these weapons in game are uh, relatively similar, at least when they fire. They come off as bright beams of light that are near instantaneous, which is kind of expected considering, you know, the munitions powered by a coil gun or railgun, I mean, it's, like it's going out super fast. The Mammoth's heavy railgun, for instance, that shoots a 16-inch projectile, something comparable to a World War II battleship gun, you know, but it's like five, six, seven times the muzzle velocity. The one that only get, the, the one that does get a bit funky is going to be the Mac Cannon, and the reason why is the velocity on those rounds are up for debate. And really, I recommend watching Installation 00's video on that very topic, because the bottom line is some of the proposed numbers that people throw out there that are in the lore as a percentage of the speed of light that goes beyond comprehension. Both the power necessary to fire it, as well as the destructive capability, it's just not something we could feasibly do today or in the future. Last but not least, all the shells that we see being fired by these electromagnetic guns are for the most part purely kinetic. We don't really see a lot of HE and certainly not prox fusing. And that's actually an application I think would be insanely beneficial for the UNSC. But backstepping a little bit, let's let's talk about the science behind these weapons. How do they work? Well, for starters, railguns, coil guns are all electromagnetic weapons. And this is actually a topic that is both, you know, there's a lot of research going into it for military and space applications. The most popular and well-known testing was conducted by the Navy and BAE Systems, a United States military production company, and this was back in the mid-2010s. Now see, they used a railgun, powered by a capacitor bank, to transfer immense currents into one rail. That rail will then transfer it through the projectile, physically through it, to the other rail. That's why it's a railgun, the, the rails sit in parallel. That that transfer of current generated a ton of force, but also a ton of heat through friction. In order for a railgun concept to work, it must maintain some sort of connection with the projectile. If you have any, you have a gap, now you start to have arcing, which is both incredibly inefficient but dangerous because of that heat. This also means that it wore the barrels out incredibly fast. You could only shoot it maybe a couple times before it would require a barrel change. On the flip side though, the projectile moving at Mach 7, I mean, it literally set the atmosphere on fire. It's really cool when you see the videos of it, it's coming out so hot, the air around it combusts. That means that the destructive potential was immense. It was absolutely outstanding. Standing. It could punch through a thick steel plate and continue flying for a long distance after. The only problem though was the electrical load associated with the technology. It's on demand but not continuous, which means you have to have a huge bank of energy to tap on a moment's notice. They're using capacitors, but they're both heavy, expensive, and they have to be constantly refilled. Now they can be hooked up to a continuous power source, such as like a nuclear reactor on a naval ship, in order to continuously refill, but the size and the scope and then the financial costs ultimately led to the project being put on pause. Railguns, though, also go beyond just physical rounds. There's actually been some experimentation done, you know, 20, 30 years ago into using railguns to propel something like plasma. Because keep in mind, plasma is a magnetic. And I actually have a, a really cool video that explores that very topic, if that's something you're interested in. Beyond railguns, we also have coil guns, aka Gauss cannons. And that, this is named after Gauss, who's one of the scientists that led to their development. These are similar to railguns, with the exception that the current doesn't pass through the projectile. Instead, 
instead you use a loop to create a magnetic field and you propel the projectile without needing physical contact, i.e. no friction. The problem though is that you're going to need something that's magnetic, ferromagnetic preferably something like iron. You can get around that by potentially using sleeves or inserts to have a, a regular round and it simply has something there to provide a little bit of pushback against electromagnetic force. And when we talk about larger applications, the idea is that instead of having just one single loop, instead you'd have one loop and then another and another and another in a line. And what would happen as the round starts to get propelled down the barrel, you would automatically switch from each loop bank to the next, continuously providing force. That said, just like the rail guns, even though it can accelerate objects to incredible rates of speed, it's still limited by the power draw. That's something that we're struggling with. The coil gun does have the significant advantage it's not going to burn through barrels like a rail gun. But both will suffer from heat management, particularly if we want to talk, you know, start talking about putting these in space. All right, tying this back to Halo. All this said, could we build something like a Mac can or even a handheld railgun? Yes, in my opinion, absolutely, in due time. And let me explain. The problem is always going to be power generation. Something like the ARC 920, the handheld railgun, will be feasible as soon as we better understand and can produce better chemical batteries. Now, I know you're going to say in the comments, be like, well, all batteries are chemical. And yes, you're correct. But I'm talking about specifically using a chemical reaction to create a single use electrical charge. If we could generate something like that, that could, you know, it would be a lot. And maybe you need more multiple cells but to power a railgun then you could have in this case i would say a coil gun because you don't want to burn through barrels and a weapon that you're going to be carrying in a squad but that is something that could be possible it just relies on us having a better understanding of material science which will come with time in my opinion for the larger weapons like the Gauss Cannon or the Mammoth's main weapon, it gets a little bit trickier and that's because the power demand of those big guns is incredible. Absolutely incredible. So you need a power source that has to be able to provide on-demand power but not necessarily continuous because keep in mind, think of like the Mammoth. If it's just trucking along, it doesn't have a massive electrical draw. But the moment that you need to fire the main gun, that's a huge spike. What you could do is have multiple capacitor banks to make that possible and just have it charging those. And then when they discharge, it can charge again. The idea is that you want to have a continuous electrical load because it's a little bit easier for like electrical production to handle versus massive spikes on demand. Things like that are actually being looked into by the military. DARPA, a very interesting, uh, to put to say the least, research group in the United States as well as the U.S. Army, have been looking into coil gun applications for things like mortars. They're actually doing a good bit of study on that back in the mid 2000s, and I actually read a report from 2006. There's still a lot, like a lot of ways to go, or it's feasible. Last but not least, Mac cannons. They're the biggest that we see in Halo. Are they doable? Well, obviously, we're not defending ourselves against aliens, but outside of that, in my opinion, yes. But I don't think it would look like how they look in Halo. And my reason being is that Halos sit in geosynchronous orbit, which doesn't make much sense. It's, well, it's not necessary. It's not that it doesn't make sense. It's just not really required. Because what that means is geosynchronous orbit means that the, the platform orbits and it basically sits, if you like, drew a line to a point on Earth, it would be static. It, it matches the orbital period of Earth. And that's important for things like maybe spy satellites or communication satellites, but it doesn't make a lot of sense for something like a defense platform because it usually sits a little bit further away. Honestly, I would say low Earth orbit would be a little bit better. You don't want to you know, get too close. You have to start dealing with atmospheric drag and having to prevent yourself from having your orbit degrade until you burn up. But if you're talking about defending Earth, you don't want to have massive gaps. You got to keep in mind the scope of space is so massive. At some point, it would be prohibitive to actually have a continuous network of defenses on top of that in some of the expanded lore it talks about how like the largest orbital platforms required ground stations no i'm sorry it's just it must have been like just a cool idea that i thrown out there but how are you going to transfer power from a ground station to something in geosynchronous orbit even low orbit when we talk about electrical currents being like you know transmitted like on lines and stuff like that resistance plays a huge role now there's ways you can get around that obviously you see high voltage uh transmission lines the United States and presumably the same on the rest of the planet is used to kind of move electricity in a manner that reduces how much of a role resistance has. When I say resistance, I mean there's always going to be a percentage of your electrical current that's lost to things like heat and materials and whatnot that cannot be overcome. And so when you talk about moving power from the planet all the way into orbit, it's just frankly it's absurd i just don't see it being doable it makes a lot more sense to have continuous power generation happen there at the platform now if you're trying to shoot the gun multiple times what i would say is have multiple capacitor banks and that way you can have a nuclear reactor continuously powering multiple banks and it goes in order and uses a bank to discharge to fire 
What this means is that the platform could have a continuous load on its power generation source despite discharging only one capacitor bank at a time. Now this will make it larger, which brings me into my next point. We talk about size and shape. In Halo, the platforms are part of the gun and I just don't agree with that. And that's largely because maneuvering, especially if you're trying to aim the gun at this point, is gonna be really difficult. Think about the people in the station getting flung around as it's violently trying to turn itself and making micro connect or corrections right before it shoots. Instead, I would say you could have a platform maybe with a radar station that's guiding all these guns, but have the guns be a simplified design, maybe just the barrel. Because when we talk about, you, you wanna have the center of gravity be very, very simple. And because when you're using thrusters, you're rotating them around the center of gravity via a moment arm. And so it just simplifies the whole aiming process. And then that way you could have one station that could do the acquisition whether that's through radar or passive emission like infrared you could still acquire targets to a significant range which brings me to my third and final point shooting guns in space gets really really weird and what i'm getting at especially when talking about being in orbit around a planet at close ranges things act normal enough but beyond like a few hundred a few thousand feet orbital mechanics starts to play a role and it's super funky for instance let's say your orbital platform was shooting down line with your orbit so like you're orbiting earth you're spinning around it and you shoot in the direction you're spinning. Well, what's gonna happen is, is because of how orbital mechanics work, that round is gonna elevate. Increased velocity, orbital velocity, causes it to elevate its orbit height, more or less. And forgive me if I'm using the wrong terms, I haven't taken orbital mechanics class since when I was in school in Eastern Germany, when it was still called Eastern Germany. The flip side too is you have Newtonian reactions. So if you shoot that round, it's elevating to a higher orbit, you also have an equal but opposite force on the station, which is gonna push it back when you talk about pushing back with orbits that's actually gonna you know degrade the orbit you're gonna fall into the atmosphere and start to burn up and and i don't mean atmosphere like low atmosphere out to 50 miles above our planet there's still enough particles in that outer exosphere to provide drag on stations that require orbital corrections and the last thing I'll touch on when it comes to max stations, when we see them in game, they have massive muzzle flashes. Now nah, there won't be any muzzle flashes because there's nothing to burn up, especially if you use a coil gun, which the lore says that MAC cans are more or less massive coil guns. There's no friction, there's no atmosphere. Yeah, you wouldn't really see anything. The round would just simply leave and it'd be moving so quickly, I don't think you'd be able to see it with the naked eye. The only difficulty is every time you fire, I would expect to see like reaction thrusters trying to fight that force to correct its position. Overall though, I think electromagnetic weapons are a classic for science fiction and Halo, and then largely it's because one of those the futuristic weapons that we're actually close to being able to produce ourselves. The power required is incredible, but as energy solutions improve, so will the weaponry. But the advantages that electromagnetic weapons have over chemical-based propulsion makes it worth it by a significant margin. And I would not be shocked if someday soon we'll have our own MAC grid to keep Earth safe, but probably just from asteroids and not the Covenant, I hope. Well, I hope you enjoyed this week's video. I love putting stuff like this out, so you can expect another one next week. Stay safe, take care, and enjoy the weekend.